So thanks for coming. Uh, what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes or so is give a very fast and furious uh, set of ideas that I hope will help you think more practically around tackling and dealing with work and wellbeing issues at work. Um, the first thing I want to ask you is, are you in any way responsible for sort of psychological well-being in your organisation? Anybody? I'm kind of thinking if you're not, then maybe in the wrong venue. Uh, uh, are you interested in psychological well-being at work? Because it's something that's been forced on you and is boring as hell. Yeah, a few boring as hell people, okay. Uh, finally, I want, I'm going to ask you to do something. Even though it's a very short session, I'm going to time it. Talk to the person next to you and just tell me how you would define psychological well-being. How would you define it? I'll give you one minute, one minute starting now. Talk. Okay, thank you very much. This is very brief. The next question, obviously linked to the definition, how might or do you assess or measure psychological well-being? How do you measure or assess it? Okay, so how do you do that? One minute, so just starting now, talk to someone. Okay, thank you very much uh, for doing that. Uh, the purpose of that will become clear in a couple of minutes, I think. How many of you have had that discussion before? Okay. So most of you are responsible for psychological well-being at work. You said that. Most of you said you're quite interested. And I think about five or six of you said you've had that discussion. Hmm. Rest that there. OK. Why is psychological well-being important for your organisation or, or, or generally? I think there's two main reasons people give. Firstly, it's because we as employers have a duty of care. That's, that's one reason. The second reason is because it's good business, right? Are there any other reasons you would give for why we should care about psychological well-being at work? Apart, I mean, and then they're broadcast. Any other reasons apart from the fact we should do it and it's good for business? It's good for people. Yeah? Responsibility. Yeah, that's kind of the first one. Duty of care, ethics, good for people, ethics. That's where I'd put that in. Anything out? Any other reason? Becoming more of a legal responsibility as well. Legal, okay, that's one I missed off, yeah. Decent human. Is that kind of ethical? Ethical, maybe, yeah, yeah, decent. Caring, yeah, decent, legal. Okay, so maybe that, yeah, that would fit under my ethical, being ethical, yeah. Right. Say again. How it contributes to society. That's true, yes, that's true. It has a wider remit as well. So I've missed at least two things off the list, thanks very much. One is the ethical thing, and I think particularly that might have impact for wider society. So it's worth bearing in mind why we do this stuff or why we do it. Again, that will become clear in a second. So I'm going to go through these four points pretty quickly. First is a, a bit of history, secondly, a bit of theory. I want to talk about five common myths that might affect the way we practice and also just a bit of reflection right at the end. So, earliest days of work organisations were people concerned about well-being, not particularly. Mechanisation came in. Yes, people were interested, but it was mostly physical well-being because people get killed uh, if they didn't. Can we get killed in office environments? It's less likely. Paper cuts, other kinds of suffering, maybe, probably not physical health. Legislation then came in to protect people from physical issues, uh, and then also recognition that mental health can suffer in terms of things like nervous breakdown and fatigues in the early 1900s through kind of very routine, repetitive kind of work. Also, we then go on to think about job redesign, job enrichments, trying to increase job satisfaction, and this idea of the happy, productive worker develops, probably in the 40s and 50s. We then go on to see psychological stress as being a major, major thing. I'm looking around the ages in this room. Many of you will be too young to remember how popular stress used to be. I think it's coming back into fashion, but it used to be incredibly popular. HSC, NIOSH and the States issued guidance. And then we had a focus more in the 1990s, I think, on more specific feelings, moods and emotions, emotional intelligence, that kind of idea. And then I think stress went out of fashion and the happiness agenda arrived. Happiness, positive psychology. We're not interested in talking about negative stuff anymore. Uh, work is good for you. And I think since 2000, there's probably more of a state, more focus on positive psychological states, such as engagement, whatever the hell that means. So it's important to bear in mind that when we're working in this field, we've, there's a kind of quite a long history here, and things have really changed quite a lot. So here's, firstly, some of the earliest examples of the way people thought about psychological well-being work was through the idea of nerves. Now, again, most of you probably would not go to your GP and say, Doctor, I've got a problem with my nerves. But if you've ever seen any Ealing comedies, that's exactly what people used to do. I've got a problem. I mean, in some cultures, people do talk, talk about their nerves. So you have nerves, your nerves go wrong, they go jangly. Self-help book, Mastering Nerves, You and Your Nerves, How to Conquer Nerves, Self-Help for Your Nerves. And this, by the way, is the last book I can find on nerves. Nerves kind of went, and what came in its place? Stress. Stress became the big thing. Forget nerves, now the explanation is stress. HSC talked about this stuff a lot uh, about 15, 20 years ago. Training, uh, 
ACAS talked about it, lots of sort of unproductive, et cetera, et cetera, millions of sick days lost. By the way, how many people here do measure when remember when stress was at its peak? Yeah? I think it correlates quite highly with age, I think. Uh, and then International Stress Management Association, um, yes, yeah, smile away stress, this very serious national problem somehow could be dealt with by people smiled a bit, astounding. Uh, celebrity endorsements, uh, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. blah. Biodots, products, some of you may recognize stress trees. I notice out there there's even still some squeezy balls. They're still going strong, your heart, so all these kind of products, stress monitors. And then we get happiness. Stress is out, happiness comes in. Uh, Optimists live longer, measure your happiness. Authentic happiness, much better than that fake happiness. Uh, just happiness. Happy for no reason, anybody, yeah? That's my favorite kind of happy, et cetera, et cetera. Happy, 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 happy. Positive psychology, then we the positive psychology bandwagon got going. Authentic happiness, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that when people thought about this stuff, it's gone through a lot of iterations. And we're now, I think, at this positive thing. I'm most recently engaged for success. Who remembers when engaged for success was launched? They were the days, weren't they? We were going to kind of completely radicalize British industry. We we're going to be competitive on the global marketplace. Ah, didn't quite work, and perhaps Brexit got in the way as well. Sorry to mention that. Right, uh, the extra mile engagement, 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 etc., etc. We've gone through quite a transition, I think, in thinking about psychological well-being at work. So that's that's the important thing to remember. So where we are now is just one point in history. Give it five years, give it ten years, we'll probably be somewhere else. I don't know. How do these things work? Well, interestingly. It's about exactly the same theory for all of them. So these are models of stress, you may recognize. Bad stuff at work, least of bad stuff, and that's bad. You all got that theory? OK, here's another one. More bad stuff at work leads to bad things, leads to bad things. Sources of stress leads to depressed mood, excessive drinking, turnover, which is bad. And then we get a satisfaction. Some things make us satisfied, and that feels good, and that's good. More satisfaction stuff, that's good for performance. More satisfaction stuff, that's good as well. And then we move to engagement. Do any of you see any similarities between all these models? It's all the same stuff. It's exactly the same model saying there are things that are about work. They make us feel in particular ways, and that's good. What's the theory? Generally, historically, around work and psychological well-being. Well, basically, the theory is good things at work are good. We like them, and that's good for us and good for the organisation. Bad stuff is bad, and that's bad. I would say, broadly speaking, no offence, that's where we still are, I think, when we talk about psychological well-being at work. Good is good, bad is bad, that's it. And for every complex problem, there's an answer that's clear, simple, and wrong. And I think that idea is fundamentally wrong. OK, five, four, it says four, there's actually five. One of the myths is there's only four myths, there's actually five myths. Five myths. <laughs> uh, and then go through these in order. So psychological well-being is getting worse. Do you reckon? If you look in the UK, at least things like job satisfaction and stress, depression, anxiety, as in self-reported, it's actually pretty stable over quite a long time. This is national representative data from CIPD. And if you just look at the yellow, obviously it goes up and down. But if you look at the yellow line since 2011, it's changed a bit, but not dramatically. Go back another 20 years, it hasn't really changed very much. This is HSE's own data. Again, it's self-reported about the prevalence and incidence of self-reported stuff. Has it really gone up, would you say? Can you see a big trend going gone up? Even if you look really, really hard and ignore some of the points, can you see anything? I mean, but yet, it's quite a common belief. There's, there's this kind of crisis going on. So don't assume there is this national decline. And also, you need to track trends in your own organization. Because even if there is or isn't a national thing, there may be a trend in your own organization. But the assumption that there are, I think, is quite unhelpful. Secondly, that psychological well-being, second myth, is a single thing. It's not a single thing. It's many different things. If you just start with the idea of subjective well-being, we have general satisfaction, emotions, very short-term, strong, focused kind of responses, and also things like mood. That's just for subjective well-being. Psychological well-being involves all kinds of other things, like sense of autonomy, personal growth, self-acceptance, and so on. And then, of course, you get also clinical conditions, things like clinically diagnosable depression, anxiety disorders, and so on. So when we talk about well-being, to me, it just makes no sense to say, talk about well-being. It's like talking about health. It doesn't mean anything. It means lots and lots and lots of things. And if we want to tackle with the problem, it's important to be clear about what we mean. It does matter what you call things. Something that drives me nuts is when people say, oh, it doesn't matter what you call things. Culture, we all know what culture is, right? It doesn't matter what you call it. It's just culture. We can manage it. It doesn't matter what you call it. 
We can manage it, really? You don't, you don't care what things are called? If you want to take something seriously, it really matters what we call things, quite simply. So all of those different aspects of well-being are different, and they have different effects and have different causes, so it, you need to kind of be a bit more precise, I think, in the way we do this. So, for example, also the idea that lower levels of anxiety are on the same continuum or scale as a mental health condition. So sometimes people, well, people look at, say, measures of anxiety or depression or even stress and go, well, actually, you know, it's like four out of ten on this scale. So that's like almost close to clinical depression or something, right? It's getting there. It probably isn't. They're probably completely different phenomena. So there's a danger in assuming a single scale. And just generally, it's quite important to focus on specific aspects of well-being. So, for example, if we are interested in, say, depression, that's fine. Let's focus on that. Let's think about that. Let's assess that, look at that in our organisation. But don't assume that's got anything to do with engagement, anything to do with mood, anything to do with emotions, anything to do with happiness, different stuff. So it's quite important to focus on particular things, I think. The third one, I think, is generally people assume that more is always better. And it seems pretty unlikely that there's a linear relationship. So for many things in HR, occupational health, psychology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they're probably not linear. So in other words, it could be that psychological well-being does matter for performance, but at a certain point, it just doesn't matter anymore. It just doesn't make much difference. You can spend a lot of try time trying to push up score well-being scores in people who are fundamentally already OK, but you're not going to do very much. You can spend a lot of effort making people a little tiny bit happier, doesn't matter to them or possibly to anyone else or anything. So I think the things to take away is you need to find out whether there is a link between particular aspects of well-being and specific outcomes. Because if you don't find that for your organisation, you might assume we just need to keep pushing these things up because more is better. No, more isn't better. And indeed, it may get to the point with some of these where actually they start to be bad. If people are exceedingly happy and excited, that's not necessarily a good thing. It depends. OK, uh, finally, and this is, this is difficult for us in practice, that work conditions, you know, the, the myth is that work conditions necessarily have a large impact, but there's many, many other things that, of course, influence people's psychological well-being. So pre-existing conditions, personality, the wider economic environment, what's going on you know, economically, other kinds of things. Things outside work affect people's well-being. Uh, is a support and provision from the state, like in the UK, that with the NHS, are the cultural shifts. So one view is that people actually expect work to bring them positive feelings of well-being in a way that if you sometimes talk to people of older generations, they go, what, you think work should make you happy? What are you talking about? It's work. It's not there to make you happy. Yeah, it may be. There's shifts in people expecting work to be rewarding and satisfying. It doesn't mean they shouldn't expect that, but it does mean when we look at these things, we have to see that historical context. Also, the, one of the biggest predictors of uh, psychological well-being is called socioeconomic status. So in an organisation, typically, that will be people lower down the hierarchy. Who remembers executive stress? Yeah, you'll really be giving away your age now if you remember executive stress. It was a really big thing. It was all the rage around the 70s and 80s. There was this real focus on executive stress and executive so stress. And of course now we probably recognise that it's, it's people lower down the hierarchy that are much more likely to experience lower levels of well-being, not the kind of executive, but it was a really big thing, and that may, may surprise some of you. So what? So the well-being you observe in your organisation, uh, based on these, the idea that, that you can't really influence it very much, may be little to do with or nothing to do with what's going on in the workplace. That's OK, but it might mean your ability to intervene to change how people feel by changing the workplace might be very limited. So you can try, but if people are coming in, say, with personality, other kinds of things, what you can do to change how people feel may be quite limited. It doesn't mean you can't try, it doesn't mean, but it may, might mean you know, you're not going to get the results you would like. The other problem for us in this context is that in general, in general, work is pretty good for people's psychological well-being. In general. So we're trying to intervene in, a, in the, the workplace where already, broadly speaking, it's quite good for people's well-being. So it's, quite, it's a much more nuanced kind of task to change and think about the workplace when already, broadly speaking, it might be quite good for people. OK, the fifth one, and this goes back to the feeling good is good and it makes you feel good and that's good for performance. Positive well-being is not necessarily good for performance and vice versa. So negative feelings are not necessarily bad. And again, I think part of the positive psychology movement is encourage people to think feeling bad is bad. It's not, it's absolutely essential. For things like sources of information, 
Someone in a workplace, if they feel anxious or scared, that might be giving them really important information about what they need to pay attention to. If people never felt anxiety, that's incredibly dangerous. Nothing wrong with anxiety, it's important. Similarly, things like to focus. So some of you may have uh, kids, those kids may have been revising for exams recently. Can you revise for an exam if you're in a really great mood? You need to feel a bit crap and possibly anxious. And certainly I remember when I used to revise for exams and the sun was shining and having a great time, I used to kind of imagine what it would be like to fail the exam, make myself feel really anxious, and then I could start focusing on revising for an exam. But I couldn't do it if I was in a good mood. So feeling bad is not bad. Certainly positive feelings are not good. Uh, pride comes before a fall. Why? Because we're not paying attention. La, 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 la. Everything's great. I'm great. Everything's good. You fall. Similarly, positive moods can inhibit critical thinking. So very, very positive moves. People cannot think and analyse detailed information. They can't do it very... It just gets in the way. In general, high performance, if that's one of the things we're interested in, needs a mix of both positive and negative emotions. It's not just one or the other. Uh, and also most things we do, if you think about anything in your life or work, anything in your life or work that you've been very, very proud of, you look back and go, I'm really glad I did that, I was put it to you, it was not wholly positive. There's probably a lot of crap in there as well. And that's one of the points. So engineering workplaces so people never experience negative emotions, again, is not really, I think, a useful thing to be doing. So what does it mean? Managing emotional well-being is not simply about improving positive emotion negative, and creating meaningful work, I mean, for workplaces, is not about just creating positive feelings. You need other stuff as well. That's pretty important. OK, so just to conclude, in general, my assumption is, and I'm sure you'd agree, that well-being professionals or people interested in this, whether it's from HR or occupational health or some other function, we should do stuff that addresses important issues, not trivial stuff. We should do stuff that's more likely to work. Do you agree? Or put your hand up if you want to do unimportant, trivial stuff. Anyone that doesn't work? Anyone? No, right. You can't disagree with this. How are we going to do it? I think there's only one way. You mentioned evidence-based practice. Essentially, you need, I think, we need to gather quality evidence from multiple sources about the likely problem. So a fundamental tenet of evidence-based practice is we start with a problem or an issue. We don't start with a solution. And out there, not surprisingly, because that, that's what they're doing, they're selling solutions. They don't know your problem. You probably don't know your problem as well as you could. So without knowing that first, it's impossible to identify a likely solution. And to do that, you also need good quality evidence from multiple sources. And by doing this, we can only do what's important and what's more likely to work. So I think that's an essential thing, particularly in a field like well-being, where back to various points about ethics, we're not just dealing about performance stuff here, we might be dealing with, you know, people's psychological well-being, and another point made, broader society's well-being. So it's important we do what's important and what's more likely to work, particularly in this field, I think. So just a reflection, just to close it. So do you, do you think you've got good quality evidence from multiple sources about your well-being problems or opportunities. So if, for example, uh, can, well, can you imagine the horror of this? I came, came to your workplace, or we met in a third space like Starbucks, and I said, so tell me about your well-being problems in your organisation. Can you bring some evidence and data showing what they are? How confident would you be you'd have kind of quite a good quantity of high-quality evidence about those problems? I don't know the answer. A few, a few very brave shakes of the head, right. So that's why we're never going to meet for coffee. It's going to be embarrassing. Uh, uh, and also, do you have good quality evidence from all sorts about likely solutions? So if I said to you, tell me all the things you're doing, all the intervention solutions around well-being, you say, here they are, Rob. I said, tell me what, what evidence do you have that these are effective? Would you have a good quantity, a good quality evidence that they were effective? I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't know. But clearly, you also need quality evidence about whether or not your interventions you're currently doing are working now for you, even if they might work in principle. So I think it's just something to think about throughout the day, and, and, and if you're just well being at work, you know, what, what are the problems really we're dealing with, what are the potential solutions, and how confident are we that's what's going on. So in conclusion, I'd say particularly more recently, there is no shortage of activity around well being at work. People are really happy to do stuff in this field. That's not the issue. But I think there are important concerns about whether what we're doing is particularly effective. And I think they're totally valid concerns and questions to ask. And I think we need to start asking more and better questions and trying to answer them rather than just doing stuff. 
And it's not our fault. We're often rewarded for doing stuff, not whether that stuff works. So I'm not blaming any particular individual or organization, but that, that's one of the problems. We do stuff. Is it addressing the poor problem? Is it actually working? Who knows? But just doing stuff, I'm pretty sure, is not very helpful. Thank you very much. <laughs>